Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Mark Siegler, and I'm honored uh, to be able to introduce you and uh, to Dr. Matt Winia. Um, I'm so happy to sort of welcome Matt back to Chicago, uh, although he's still in Colorado. We've missed him greatly in the past seven years um, since, since he moved from Chicago uh, to Colorado. Uh, <clears> that Dr. Winnie is the director um, for Center for Bioethics and Humanities and a professor at the University of Colorado School of Medicine and the Colorado School of Public Health and at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus. Um, Matt is board certified in internal medicine and infectious disease with additional training in public health and health services research. He, he led the Institute for Ethics uh, at the American Medical Association in Chicago for 15 years, uh, working nationally and internationally uh, on issues related to professionalism and the social rules of physicians. In 2015, as I mentioned, uh, he moved to Colorado to become the director um, uh, of the University of Colorado's Center for Bioethics and Humanities, an image of which is over Matt's left shoulder right now. <laughs> it's quite beautiful. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the Center for Bioethics is involved in the education of all health professional students at Colorado University. It facilitates clinical ethics, case consultation, for hospitals on the Anschutz Medical Campus, and it carries out a research agenda to better understand the complex ethical challenges facing medicine and society. Dr. Winia has led national projects on issues including public health and disaster ethics, uh, on ethics and quality improvement, on communication, on team-based care, and engaging patients as members of the team and on medicine and the Holocaust. He served on many committees and panels for the National Academy of Medicine, the Joint Commission and others, um, uh, he, he, including serving on the Blue Ribbon Panel that examined changes in ethics policies and structures of the American Psychological Association that followed the group's involvement in the Bush administration's coercive interrogation, otherwise known as a torture program. M Matt has delivered more than two dozen named lectures and visiting professorships, has authored more than 150 published articles, co-edited uh, several books and co-author of a book on fairness of healthcare benefit design. Uh, among other leadership roles, he's president of the, Amer has been the past president of the American Society for Bioethics and Humanities and the past chair of the Ethics Forum of the American Public Health Association and of the Ethics Committee of the Society for General Internal Medicine. Today's title of Dr. Winnie's talk is as follows. Um, How healers become, became killers, Nazi doctors and contemporary Bioethics. I'm honored to introduce you uh, to Dr. Matt Winia. Matt, please. Yeah, thank you so much, Mark. It is um, it is a pleasure to be uh, even virtually back in Chicago and with old friends uh, yourself, Mindy. I we were talking just before we got started. This lecture series this year that Mindy has put together is just so uh, outstanding. It's really been a lot of fun uh, to listen into some of these. Um, and I, I anticipate going back and listening to a number of others uh, on, on video later. Um, I'm going to speak today about work that, um, that I started to become interested in um, because I was invited to the Holocaust Museum when I was working at the AMA um, to see this special exhibition called Deadly Medicine, Creating the Master Race when it was still on storyboards. Um, so it hadn't been mounted yet. Um, and the, the staff at the museum, the historians there wanted to know 
how physicians might respond uh, to this information because it, at least at that time, was not a very well-known history. Um, there had been, an, you know, several books written about this, so it's not a, it, it wasn't exactly a hidden history, but on the other hand, it was not a much talked about history. And we've subsequently done some research on this and found that relatively small proportion of medical school, school excuse me, have any formal curriculum that addresses the legacy of medicine's involvement in the uh, Nazism and the Holocaust and how it affects uh, the way we think about medical issues uh, and ethical issues today. So the title of the talk today is about health professionals in the Nazi era, um, how healers become killers. Um, and I've, I, I adjusted the, the talk a little because I wanna be very explicit here that I think it's important to learn from the past in order to both understand the present and to build the future that we want. Um, and if we, you know, at risk of being trite, uh, the Santiana quote has something to it, right? It, those who fail uh, to learn from the past are condemned, not necessarily to repeat it, but to, um, but to, to uh, misunderstand or misinterpret echoes of the past that continue to affect today. And understanding how our profession became so involved in uh, the Nazi program, I think um, you, you will see uh, the echoes today. Um, there is a way of giving this talk, I think, where you sort of uh, toggle back and forth between past and present. I will say I find that to be um, challenging for a couple reasons that I'll say more about in a moment. Um, but what I'm gonna do today is just tell the story. And um, I think you will, you will see the resonance, you will see the echoes. Um, I'll, I'll give you a few examples towards the end of the ways in which I tend to think about how to learn from this past um, to create a better future. Um, but mainly today, I'm just gonna kind of tell the story, which by the way, um, this will not come as a shock, but it is a difficult um, story. It is a painful story because um, as my colleague at the museum, uh, Dr. Patricia Haber-Rice likes to say, this is an understudied and underexplored aspect of medical, uh, of the history of the Holocaust. And in part, it's that way because it is so comforting to think of our ethics, the ethics of, of medicine and of health professionals as being um, those of caring, of compassion, of help for the least vulnerable, and that that core of our ethics is immutable, that it is solid, that it rests on firm foundations. And yet, as you all know, um, the history of medicine in Nazism and the Holocaust is probably the best documented example of the tenuous nature in some ways of our professional ethics. Um, and in fact, this history is incredibly powerfully influential on the way we think about ethical issues today, even when we don't realize it, right? So I defy you to think of a topic today that is not in some way influenced by the legacy of health professional involvement in the Holocaust, whether it's beginning and end of life issues, issues related to disability, issues related to certainly abortion, issues related to genomics, uh, to public health, to high health care uh, expenditures, to access to care. All of these issues are sort of seen through the lens of this um, history and this experience. Um, I have an intentionally blank slide here and uh, um, I have it blank because I wanna say something just to you without uh, the distraction of a slide um, before I, I, I jump into this. Um, this is undoubtedly the most difficult talk I give. Um, and I like to say every talk I give is a little bit difficult because the only talks that are ethics talks are talks about issues that are difficult. Um, it, if it's an issue that we all agree on, it's not really an ethical issue anymore. It, it may be challenging in other ways, but, um, but it doesn't have the ethics um, angle on it. But this one is hard for two reasons, one personal and one professional. Um, the personal reason is that 
I mean, you all know, uh, probably most of the people listening right now give talks. Um, and when you give a talk, it is possible that someone in the audience knows the material better than you do, right? That's, that's always a, a, an issue that there are gonna be people in the audience who know pieces uh, of whatever you're talking about better than you do. Um, this is different because there are people, uh, including some you know, listening right now, who own this material in a way that I never will. Um, because I'm not Jewish, I'm not German, I have no personal familial connection to this history. And yet, if there is one thing I've learned from uh, working with the museum, it's that somehow we all have to come to own this history. Um, this is not just Jewish history. Uh, this, it is, this is the history of, of the profession that we are all involved in. Um, it is our shared history and it has um, players that are, you know, in some ways I've, I find it actually a little unfair um, to leave remembrance of these, of this history to the Jewish community. Um, they weren't the perpetrators here. Um, so so I, I feel it's important uh, for people who are not, you know, from a Jewish background, for people who are not German, for people who, are just interested in how our profession came to be where it is today um, to own this history in a way. Um, this, the second way this is difficult is um, on a professional level, I just find it um, to be an incredible challenge for people to learn from this history. Um, and the reason for that is, you know, anytime you uh, make any kind of comparison between then and today, you immediately risk what people call playing the Nazi card or reductio ad Hitlerum, uh, as it's been called. Um, and there's there's a good deal of, of um, truth to that type of accusation, right? Because there is nothing that I can think of today that is exactly comparable, right? The, there's not a, a direct analogy um, to what happened then. Uh, you know, we, we do a lot of worrying about uh, research ethics today, but I will say there is nothing that is going on today that um, is the same as uh, intentionally infecting a young child with typhus, watching until they die, and then killing their healthy twin so that you can compare their organs, right? That, nothing we, that we can think of today is going to be the same as that. A and yet, somehow we have to figure out how to learn from this history, the echoes of this history, the, the lesser versions of this history, or uh, as I said, we are condemned to see uh, repeat episodes. And I'll give you some examples of these uh, as we move forward. So, so here's the question um, and, and the history we're going to explore. How did healers become killers? Um, and to, to really understand this, you actually have to go uh, quite a ways back, um, well before the Nazi period. In fact, um, as we explore this, um, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna come to this sort of uh, difficult uh, realization which, um, which I, I, I'm going to try to defend, and it'll sound a little outlandish, um, but it is uh, not mine to, uh, to own in the sense that I'm not the first to have uh, had this insight. Um, this is Dr. Andrew Ivey at the Nuremberg Doctors' Trial, who essentially, as he learned more and more about the role of health professionals in the Nazi regime, came to believe that the entire idea and technique of death factories for genocide would not have materialized without the involvement of the medical community. And that that involvement had started long before um, the era of the Nazis. In fact, I think you can probably trace this at least back as far as Plato who in book five of the Republic talks about um, protecting the purity of the guardian's breed. 
and having healthy and valued people beget as many children as possible, while those who are less healthy, less valuable, uh, not only should they have fewer children, but their offspring, if they are born uh, and are seen to be inferior, that they be properly disposed of in secret. So the idea here is the beginnings of what we would um, later come to call eugenics. And the basic ideas of eugenics are those of selective breeding, right? The idea that if you can create uh, a stronger ox or a faster horse, that you can also create a more strong human uh, race or breed. And the, the core of uh, eugenics is in these two arms. Positive eugenics is where you define people who are valuable, you support them in healthy living and in reproduction, but it's often paired with this idea of negative eugenics, which is there are also those then who are less valuable those people will be marginalized, discouraged from reproduction and so on. And this really comes to a head in this almost perfect storm of um, the new science of uh, public health and epidemiology. So people start counting things and developing, you know, P values and ideas of, uh, of, of, of regression to the mean and right, all of these notions of epidemiology and public health are being uh, created at the end of the 1800s, beginning of the 1900s. This coincides with the rediscovery of Mendelian genetics and with Darwinian evolution, which, uh, which generates this notion of social Darwinism. And so Galton is the one credited uh, or discredited with, um, with coining the the term eugenics, but this these ideas are really the confluence of multiple strands of um, of scientific uh, investigation leading up to them. Um, eugenics is not a German invention. Uh, if anything, it is most tied to uh, the UK and to the Americas, uh, to the US in particular. Carl Pearson some of you will probably recognize as the namesake of the Pearson chi-square test. He's also the person who uh, discovered the phenomenon of regression to the mean. Very famous guy. The Grammar of Science uh, became an incredibly well-known science book. Um, in fact, uh, Albert Einstein assigned this book as the first reading in his Olympia Academy in New York uh, when he moved there. And uh, you'll notice here that the idea of struggles of race against race, and by the way, the notion of an Aryan race are already in the sort of scientific literature in 1901 when Adolf Hitler is 11 years old. The eugenics movement is an international movement. Again, you will notice a few of the folks from this first international eugenics conference who will go on to become uh, infamous Nazis, Alfred Plotz, uh, Ernst Rudin, um, but most of these are not Germans. Um, and you will also recognize a number of these folks as becoming or as being really the luminaries of American and European science. Um, this conference is remarkable because in, in many ways, um, and the, the, um, the entire proceedings are readily available to you if you ever want to look through this, but um, this is Alfred Punnett, um, by the way, Punnett squares, if you remember your high school biology. Um, so Punnett uh, talked about feeble-mindedness, which was considered to be a genetic condition that was passed along from generation to generation, saying that if we could just prevent feeble-minded people, people from marrying and having babies, within a few generations, we could eliminate feeble-minded people from our community. This is um, reproduced in a number of um, organizations and uh, and programs around the US. This is the International Conference on Race Betterment uh, held in Battle Creek, Michigan, just a couple of years later. Again, the illuminaries list of attendees here, uh, including a guy named Harry Laughlin, who would end up writing a model law for race betterment, which was oriented 
around forcible sterilization of people who were deemed to be dangerous to the community. Uh, Harry Laughlin's model law would be adopted across the United States. Most states had forcible sterilization programs. Um, again, well before the Nazi era, this is um, uh, a speak. I found this at a used bookstore in Chicago a number of years back, um, and it's from 1913. You could invite someone from the AMA out to your state or specialty society. Well, not specialties at that time, but um, but to your state society or to your church group um, to give talks. And I'll just show you the page from Colorado, which shows you know Dr. Corwin here, who will talk about eugenics and how it's going to save society. I would say probably. 20% of the uh, talks that you could invite people out to give were around issues of race betterment and eugenics. Um, Americans, by the way, um, before I get to the eugenics laws around, uh, around sterilization, I should say we were very much in the forefront of race uh, policy, right? The idea that races were a thing, that they were a biological thing, that one race posed a threat to another race as a biological matter. That was very American. Um, and it comes out of, you know, and so we so we were at the forefront of things like um, making laws to define who counts as being black versus who counts as being white, which ends up becoming very important in Nazi Germany, right? They have to make a law about who's going to count as being Jewish and who's going to count as being non-Jewish or Aryan. And you have to look at, you know, how many grandparents, how many generations back. And of course, you know, as many of you know, in the, in the American states, there were a number that had so-called one drop rules where a single prior ancestor at any remove would make you a black person. And that was written into the law. The Germans actually, when the Nazis came to power, they, uh, they sent a delegation to the American South to study American race laws and see whether they could use any of these uh, laws as uh, to help inform their laws for defining who would be Jewish, uh, which would become, by the way, the Nuremberg codes, right? The Nuremberg laws uh, around uh, the, the uh, racial purity. Um, in Germany. And actually, they saw our one drop rule in the US and said that's way too extreme for the Nazis. Uh, the Germans will never accept that. And in fact, um, when the Nuremberg laws are passed, you have to have three grandparents Jewish in order to count as fully Jewish. If you only have two, you're mixed, as they call the Michelin. Um, and if you have less than two, then, uh, then you are actually considered to be Aryan. Um, but this is a more direct, even a more direct uh, way in which American race policy uh, affect and eugenics policy affected German policy um, well before uh, well before uh, the uh, the uh, Nazis come to power. We had been experimenting with sterilization laws, uh, and so these had started in Indiana in 1907. And Indiana's law actually was adopted and then reversed and then adopted again a couple times while they figured out how to create due process provisions and so on. So Americans had been, do, you know, the laboratory of the states in the US had been working on how to create a sterilization law that would pass constitutional muster in the US um, for uh, a generation by the time the Nazis came to power in most US states had laws that allowed for the forcible sterilization of individuals on eugenic grounds. Even states, by the way, like Colorado, which is listed as not having a law, we have well-documented cases of people being sterilized against their will. So this was uh, really ubiquitous across, across the US at this time, that you could be sterilized against your will if you were seen to pose a threat. And these laws, were endorsed um, and authorized by the Supreme Court in 1927, again, before the Nazi era. And I highlight this because there's a famous or an infamous quote here from Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes that three generations of imbeciles are enough and that justifies forcible sterilization of Carrie Buck. But I highlighted also the sentence before that because it shows how this was entirely framed around public health. This was about um, preventing this person from infecting the rest of the community 
with feeble-mindedness, which again uh, was considered to be a genetically heritable trait. Um, I will say, by the way, that uh, Carrie Buck herself was not feeble-minded, nor was her daughter. Her daughter uh, grew up only to about the age of eight um, before she died of, a, of an infectious illness, but she got normal grades in school. Carrie herself received average grades in school. So neither one of them was feeble-minded, but Carrie got pregnant outside of wedlock. She was probably raped by uh, the nephew of the, of the foster family she was living with. Her mother may actually have had a cognitive disability and she was institutionalized with a cognitive disability, but Carrie ended up, uh, because she became pregnant, she, be, she was institutionalized um, because the family essentially said she must be promiscuous and that's a, a trait of feeble-minded individuals. Um, so when the Nazis come to power um, in 1933, January, one of the first laws they pass is this law for the prevention of progeny with hereditary diseases. They base this law on the American law, the, the Harry Laughlin's model um, eugenic uh, sterilization law. So this looks very almost word for word in many instances, um, to be well translated into German, but this is essentially the California law. California was the most active of the US states. Um, Germany is going to implement this law in a very aggressive way. So in the United States, we have these laws on the books um, for about 70 years. And over those 70 years, we would forcibly sterilize in the medical system about 70,000 people. Germany will sterilize 400,000 people in about five years. Um, in a country roughly a third the size of the US. So uh, they're very aggressive about this, but they do it in using the American model law. So they create these hereditary health courts, which operate in parallel to the German judicial system. Um, you know, Hitler is a dictator. He hates the courts because the courts are uh, potentially a, a constraint on his rule. So he sets up separate from the court system, these hereditary court systems, which are manned by uh, two doctors and one judge. So uh, the doctors have the decisional authority. The judge, on the other hand, has tie-breaking authority. So both play very important roles, um, but there are about 250 of these set up all around the country. The Nazis are very well aware that they are basing this on international uh, other countries. So that they have this, we are not alone poster that, uh, that essentially is advertising the fact that they're not the only ones doing this forcible sterilization, that this is a widely accepted um, strategy. So you, you might think, okay, so um, we are trying our best to prevent uh, people with these uh, congenital illnesses from being born. What happens if a child is born with a congenital illness anyways? What if they slip through the cracks? And um, this is from Karl Brandt, who was Hitler's personal physician. And he becomes the chief defendant at the Nuremberg doctor's trial. So you have to take what he says with a giant grain of salt because he lies a lot on the stand. Um, but according to uh, Karl Brandt, there was a child born with a severe deformity um, named uh, Naur. Uh, he was sent to examine the child and determine whether that child should be, uh, should be granted a mercy death. Um, and what he decides is that th this is warranted but we should do it in such a way that the parents won't find, won't believe that they had to be the ones who had to make this difficult decision. That that's a, a challenging decision and doctors should be the ones who make that decision. Um, this is in fact the beginning of what would become uh, the so-called child euthanasia program. And I have euthanasia in scare quotes here because this is not euthanasia as you might envision the debates over euthanasia happening today. These are not you know, parents asking for um, help uh, allowing their child a gentle death. Um, these are, this is a cynical program of mass murder implemented by the Nazis in which parents are tricked. 
So any child who is born with one of these conditions um, will receive a letter from the state saying that they should be sent to a special treatment program. They would arrive at this special treatment program. They would then be starved to death or sometimes killed through an injection of phenol directly into the heart. But the parents would be told that the, that the child was initially doing well, then they would get another letter saying, so sorry, they've taken a turn for the worse. And then they would get a letter saying they died uh, typically of pneumonia. Those children would then have brain samples taken and they would be um, you know, disposed of, or sometimes their bodies would be kept for uh, research purposes. This is the first mass murder program of the Nazis preceding the Shoah or the attempted genocide of European Jews by roughly two years. Um, and it, in this program, or between five and 10,000 um, children with disabilities will be murdered. This program, the child program, pretty quickly expands to older and older children. And it becomes what we are now, now call the T4 program, a very infamous program um, in which from Tiergartenstrasse 4, hence the name T4, uh, this is the address of the central office in Berlin. In the T4 program, um, seven killing centers are established across, around the country, mostly in the basements of existing uh, psychiatric or other uh, long-term care facilities. And what will happen is across the country, people who run long-term care facilities are required to fill out a form in which they describe each patient and whether that patient is likely ever to be recovered or well enough to work. And if they are deemed to be not uh, recu recoverable or they'll never be well enough to work, then they are seen as useless eaters, as being a, de a dead weight within the state, or even as a fifth column, a danger to the state because they're taking resources that ought to be better used in the war effort as the war comes on. And Hitler, in fact, um, backdates the approval for this program to the date of the, of the, of the beginning of the war um, because he felt it would be easier to carry this program out in wartime. The idea here is that people who are non-productive and in a long-term institutional facility will be sent again to these special treatment programs, same language is used. When they arrive at these special treatment programs, they are stripped down, told they're going to take a shower. They go into what looks like a shower, but is in fact a gas chamber. They are gassed to death. Their dental gold is then removed and they are burned in specially designed crematory ovens. And if that process sounds familiar to you, it should. Because many of the uh, camouflage techniques that were then later transported to use in the Holocaust itself are developed and perfected in the T4 program by the medical personnel running these programs. So um, there is a moment in the war in the summer of 1941 when um, some church leaders and people in the community, this is all a secret, illegal, clandestine program, right? It's still illegal to murder people in Germany, um, even, on, even on the Fuhrer's orders. So, um, so this is an illegal program under German law. And so it is secret, um, but it becomes an open secret. And in fact, there are you know, stories of children because they're the, 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 these bodies are being cremated, you know, hair will come down uh, in the smoke into the local towns. And the, the parents will sometimes tell their children, you know, don't be bad or they'll take you up and, you know, put you in the ovens in there, right? So this is, this becomes a, a widely recognized secret. In fact, there's an article written about this in an American journal um, about how uh, Germans are killing their disabled community. Um, and so uh, Hitler, again, he's a dictator, but he cares about public opinion. 
And so in uh, 1941, he pauses the euthanasia program or stops it. Um, just before he stops it, he had actually started already to transport pieces of the, of the, the strategy used for the T4 program to the camps. And the purpose of this, this is called the 14F13 program. The purpose of this is there are people in the camps who are becoming unproductive. And rather than keeping them alive when they can no longer work, they're going to murder them in the same way that they're murdering people in this T4 program because these were productive workers in labor camps, but they're now no longer productive. And so if there's a judgment made that this person will never be able to return to work, we are not going to keep them in the infirmary and keep using resources on them. Instead, we're going to kill them and, and cremate them. So the, so the technique of the T4 program has been brought to the labor camps. And then when it's paused, you're left with about 100 individuals who are you know, trained in the killing process. They're inured to the killing process. They are known to be uh, reliable because they've kept this secret uh, for a long time, and they're now all out of work because the T4 program has been halted. So many of them are actually moved to uh, help create and run the Reinhardt camps. So for example, the first commandant, uh, the Reinhardt camps, by the way, are Belzic, Sobibor, and Treblinka. So the first commandant at Treblinka is a guy named Dr. Imfred Eberl who had been a leader in the T4 program. Treblinka, by the way, um, is the camp to which the Warsaw Ghetto is evacuated for killing. Um, about 900,000 people um, died at Treblinka. So this is the euthanasia center at Bernberg. And here's the one at Auschwitz. And I just want to um, say that this um, similarity is not an accident. The apparatus, the techniques of camouflage, um, the uh, a variety of you know tools, including the specific crematory technology, was developed in the T4 program and then used for the attempted extermination of the Jewish community and the Roma Sinti community and the LGBTQ community and the African German community, et cetera, um, in Germany. So um, I just wanna back up for a moment here and talk a little because you might think given how this evolved, the, the German medical community before the war was in the ethical dark ages. Um, and unfortunately, really nothing could be further from the truth. Um, a great irony of the Nuremberg doctor's trial is that at the time of the trial, which as you all know, largely focused on uh, research abuses, which uh, I haven't said anything about research abuses, um, but they went looking for ethical standards for conduct of research on human beings, um, national standards, international standards, they were looking you know, all over for what are the standards for doing research on human beings. And ironically, they found only two, both were German. So the German scientist, Albert, Prussian scientist, Albert Neisser, um, whom some of you may recognize as the namesake, namesake for Neisseria gonorrhea, Neisser had done uh, trials in which he intentionally infected orphans and prostitutes with syphilis as a way to test different treatments. When that became known by the local community, um, the uh, Prussian government passed a law requiring the informed consent of human subjects of medical research. That idea of uh, the unambiguous consent is the way it was framed of the human subject of medical research as well, by the way, as the idea of an IRB, uh, was called something else, but an ethics review uh, panel. That was all um, implemented in the Weimar Republic in 1931. So this was a, a nationwide German law, which was never explicitly repealed 
during uh, the war. So the Germans were actually ahead of their time with regard to regulations of research on human subjects. They were also ahead of their time in terms of scientific advances. This is the Siemens electron microscope, which was developed in Germany, the electron microscope. And just to give you one uh, quick illustration of this, if you wanted training in, uh, you know, the best training in the world in medicine and science, you went to Germany in this era. So if you were training in the 1920s and 30s, um, just, just again, quick uh, anecdote here, of the 10 Nobel Prizes awarded between, uh, in the 10 years before the war, six Germans, six German speakers, won Nobel Prizes in the 10 years before the war. Imagine, imagine if the US got six of 10 you know, Nobel Prizes in a, in a decade. Um, so Germany was at the top of the heap in terms of science and technology. It was also at the top of the heap in terms of application of science to public health. So this is one of the first um, public uh, epidemiology uh, research projects looking at smokers and non-smokers and different types of cancers. Also looking at um, gender here, because you'll notice that if you happen to speak German, um, this, the uh, cancers that are very prevalent among non-smokers are things like breast cancer, because women tended not to smoke. Men were smokers, and so um, you see these you know, very strong correlations. The Nazis used what they were learning to do things like encouraging women to do breast self-examination and to track their period for evidence of early breast or uterine cancer. They encouraged women to have plenty of babies and to treat their bodies well while they were pregnant, to drink uh, apple cider instead of alcohol and avoiding nicotine during pregnancy. They even banned smoking in party offices as well as many other public spaces. And by the way, I'll just highlight the, uh, on that cigar, you'll see the sort of African looking head. They were very explicit about smoking being a vice of degenerate Africans. And by the way, I use degenerate in a very explicit way here, right? The idea of degenerate comes from the notion that there are genetic generate, there are genetic components of degeneracy right? A, a degenerate person is someone who has a, a, a biological inferiority baked in. This notion, of course, um, is all part of this eugenic paradigm. And in Germany, again, early in the regime, you are required to go to a doctor's office um, or to a genetic counselor, you would call them today, to decide with you whether you are allowed to get married and have babies. Um, and the idea here, you know, is very simplistic Mendelian genetics. Um, but the idea here is that the, they're going to use medical science to create a master race. And this is, again, baked in to the medical enterprise. Um, the, uh, the medical practice law for Germany is changed by 1938 in a way that says it is the explicit responsibility of the medical community to ensure racial purity and sound heredity of the German people. That is the primary aim of the medical community after 1938. This is, um, again, throughout the uh, German sort of bio biology uh, spectrum. So this is from a high school biology textbook. Um, but I want to point out, um, this, is, uh, this is not much to do with actual biology, right? This is about, uh, this particular image here is about the idea that people with biological um, hereditary illnesses are costly to the state. That's what they're really pushing here. Not so much, you know, what causes these hereditary illnesses, et cetera. This is tying the well being of these individuals with the well being of the state, with the idea being that you want doctors to start to think of the state as their patient 
and not any given individual human being, right? So this is uh, Adolf Hitler making this explicit claim that he is the doctor of the entire people, that he's going to create health across the community. And if you have to get rid of some people in order to make the larger whole healthy, that's not only acceptable, but that may become and, and does become, according to the German medical community, ethically required. And Hitler, again, very explicit about this early in his regime, he comes to the German uh, medical community and says, I can do without engineers, I don't need teachers, but you, doctors, what I'm doing here is fundamentally a project of what one of his deputies, Rudolf Hess, called what, I, what he's doing here is applied biology. He's applying biological principles across the entire uh, community of the German people. So I asked at the beginning, how do healers become killers? And one answer is that they become synchronized around this goal and no longer um, around the goal of being the protectors of their most vulnerable patients. And this isn't just doctors, by the way. I put up the Hadamar nurses who were, um, a number of them put on trial afterwards in a, in a, in a nursing trial. Um, one of the uh, papers I read recently suggested that 62% um, of oral and maxillofacial surgeons were members of the Nazi party um, in different areas. Over half of German doctors were members of the Nazi party. Um, and there are many questions about why it is that such high proportions of the medical profession ended up as members of the Nazi party, because after all, it's obviously not required. Half the people were not members of the Nazi party. Um, so when you see a number like that, half being members of the Nazi party, and you look at you know, engineers and lawyers where the numbers are much, much smaller on the order of you know, 10 or 20%, um, why is it that the Nazi regime was so appealing to the medical community? And one of the reasons is that, uh, and there are, again, lots of hypothesizing about this, so not one answer. Um, the German medical community was beaten down after the war there, uh, after the First World War. There was actually doctor unemployment at this time in Germany. So there was a lot of competition. Um, the Jewish community had a lot of people in the medical field. And so there were plumb positions in medicine that would be vacated when the Jewish um, doctor doctors were kicked out of the medical uh, societies and were no longer allowed to practice, no longer allowed to hold positions of leadership. And again, this is very early in the Nazi regime. So the Nazis disband all of the professional associations and create a single national medical association, which is essentially run by the state. And this is you know, in 1933, so six months after they come to power. This is reported on in JAMA and in other journals around the world. Very little um, protest, however, about this. Um, people just sort of thought it was interesting, I guess, uh, what was going on in Germany, um, but did not see where it, was, uh, where it was potentially heading. Outside, by the way, of the Jewish community, where of course there were protests when Jewish doctors were all kicked out of the medical um, professional bodies. But they pretty rapidly coalesce around this notion of, um, of creating a master race. They're given a lot of power um, in the German community. Um, they have a lot of political power um, and, a lot of, uh, and a lot of sense of, I think, uh, you know, misplaced, obviously. I, I need to keep uh, saying that, but pride in the role that they are playing in this whole enterprise because it is a leading role in the Nazi enterprise. This is a very disturbing image um, and I apologize for putting it up, but I, I wanna hammer home the medicalization of the process of murder. Um, there, this is not a photo of Treblinka, but I wanna describe uh, the killing pit at Treblinka. 
Um, there are no known images of Treblinka. Um, it was destroyed completely after the war and, and many of the record, all the records that they could get to were burned. Um, but it's described um, as having been a train station that looked like uh, a real train station, like people came and went. There were posters that said, you know, vacation in Corsica and, um, and uh, as though, you know, timetables, as though there were trains coming and going. Um, there were not, of course, this was a dead end stop. It was just a killing center. Um, there was in this train station, a door with a red cross over it, um, which you might think goes to the infirmary, but this was a cynical facade. It in fact led to a killing pit for people who were too weak to walk up to the, um, the gas chambers. People who came off the train and needed to be dispatched immediately would be taken to the killing pit and records were kept in which they would literally write, the patient was cured with one pill, meaning murdered with a single shot to the head. And from that level of medicalization of murder, it is maybe less difficult to envision the pieces of this history that are most likely that you've heard of, like ramp duty at Auschwitz, which is you know, probably the most famous um, outside of the, of the uh, experimentation um, it, uh, accounts. This is probably the most famous duty of physicians. It was also a duty taken by pharmacists, by nurses, by all the health professionals essentially took turns doing ramp duty where they would decide as people came off the train, which ones would go straight to the gas chambers and which ones were healthy enough for forced labor or were twins and were uh, sent for experimentation, that kind of thing. By the way, um, ramp duty was uh, taken in rotation, but it was not required. Um, there is no record of any physician or anyone else being punished for refusing to do ramp duty, but very few refused. Uh, men like Dr. Hans Munch, um, who famously uh, declined uh, to do ramp duty were simply assigned to something else. These um, two images are perhaps the most disturbing and they're cartoons, um, but they're cartoons that really illustrate this question because you may, you may be surprised to learn that one of the first things that the Nazis do um, is to ban vivisection of lab animals. Um, in experimentation. So this has the lab animals of Germany saying Heil Goring because Goring had said that he would commit to a concentration camp anyone who thought they could treat a lab animal as uh, mere property. So one wonders, what are the Jewish people? What are the Roma, the Sinti? that they can be treated as less worthy of respect even than a lab animal? And here is the answer. Here you see the scientific gaze of a microscope looking down on the Petri dish of society. Here, people have become pathogens. So to close this up, I wanna have just a, a reflection here on the obligations of remembrance. Um, what are our obligations? Recognizing the integral leading roles that our profession played in bringing about one of, if not the uh, greatest crimes against humanity in, in human history. And I think there are some uh, contemporary implications that people often talk about, the most uh, you know, famous being consent and the idea of human research subjects experimentation rules coming out of the Holocaust. And there is something um, about the Nuremberg Code that it, it, it does in many people's minds mark the sort of birth of uh, modern research ethics. But when Dr. Ivy was sent to uh, Nuremberg to testify, as I mentioned, they were looking for human subjects research standards 
And he went back to the AMA during the trial and said, we're gonna need some ethics standards around human subjects research. So in December of 1946, in the middle of the trial, the AMA passes this little paragraph of ethical standards for human subjects research. So we did not have these standards. They were created only because we needed them in the context of a trial. And, um, and the, it didn't even work at the trial, by the way, because the prosecutors were good, but the defending attorneys were also very good at their jobs. And they figured out that this was a brand new document. So it didn't even help in terms of the context of the trial. And worse yet, because these were written for Nazi monsters and not for fine upstanding American scientists, and those by the way are quotes from the time, um, they were not applicable to us. And so for another 30 years after the Nuremberg Code, we continue things like the Willowbrook experiment and the uh, US Public Health Service study at Tuskegee. And this is one of the reasons why it's so important to try to learn from this history. In many ways, I think the ongoing research study at Tuskegee is a result of our inability to learn from the experience of the Nazi doctors. So let me give you a couple of echoes um, just to spark some thoughts about this. Um, and these are difficult, right? These are not simple um, answers. These are not simple questions. Um, how do we balance devotion to serving every individual in front of us? and our obligations to the larger community, which are real, right? We can't just take out of this history that the only thing we care about is the one person sitting in front of us and we have no social or societal level responsibilities. We do. In fact, if you wanna boil it down to a really simplistic um, example, every time I'm seeing one patient, that patient might benefit from me spending some more time with them but I have other patients who are waiting. So every time I have to say, you know, let's pick up this conversation next time because I have other people I need to get to, I am balancing the needs of the one and the needs of the many, let alone when I, you know, make a report on someone's infectious illness to the public health system, or when I, you know, tell someone that I don't think they're actually safe to drive anymore. These are all areas where we actually do have to balance the needs of the community and the needs of our individual patients. How do we do that in a way that is respectful of this past, that where we learn from this past, um, and also where we move forward with you know, reasonable expectations uh, for all of us? How do we think about novel science, like eugenics as a theory? which had this you know, inflated expectations for how it was going to create a new world. This by the way, is, uh, this graph is not from medicine so much as from tech, but it's called the hype cycle. And the idea is that people have this tremendous expectation of a new idea that it's gonna change the world. And then they go through the trough of disillusionment and eventually hit a, a plateau in which you actually are using this new thing. But how do we balance skepticism of new science, humility around new science, but also recognize that science is right sometimes, right? So how do we, we don't want, we also don't want people to be skeptical of climate science, of vaccine science, right? You, you can see over skepticism, you can also see under skepticism. So what's the right balance of skepticism and humility? What about uh, professional self-regulation around this? The Nazi doctors were incredibly good at self-regulation. They, um, they were terrific at enforcing their professional ethical standards. In the wake of the war, we were terrible at enforcing professional ethical standards. Very few Nazi doctors ever were brought to trial. There was one former Nazi who became president of the World Medical Association, another who almost became president before the AMA and the Israeli Medical Association outed him uh, and we prevented him from becoming president of the WMA. 
Um, we have, you know, a, a terrible history of actually holding people to the ethical standards that we claim to uh, to hold as very dear, and um, and somehow we have to figure out how to uh, apply our ethical standards, recognizing that our ethical standards can be wrong over time as well. Uh, what about this issue of professional distance and empathy and the fact that as we go through our training, we do become somewhat inured to human suffering? That's real, right? As you become a doctor, as you become a nurse, um, in order to do this work, you have to be able to move from one suffering person to another and treat the second person really well and have a smile on your face, even though you're still thinking about that last person. That does cause you um, to become a little bit hardened. And, you know, so we use literature, we use history, we use a, a variety of techniques for trying to help people retain their humanity while they enter this field. Um, and I'll just end with this uh, quote from Robert Proctor, the Holocaust historian, who said that, uh, you know, and I won't read this, you all can read the quote, but I'll just add to it that in addition to our ability to understand the origins of these crimes, we also, if we can't learn from this history, we can't apply any of the things that can be learned to uh, the world moving forward. We can't apply them to learning how to create a world in which similar crimes are not likely to arise again in the future. Because I think what, what we really have to grapple with here is not so much maybe what some people come to this history thinking if, if you know, what you've heard of is Mengele. You might think the question is, you know, how do you prevent a few rogue actors from infecting the medical community? But this was not that. The question we have to grapple with here is how did most medical professionals in the most advanced industrialized nation on the planet become murderers together and not despite their training, not despite their ethics, but in the name of medicine and science and public health. I'll just close with that question. Well, um, thank you, Matt. I mean, obviously, that was an unbelievably powerful uh, lecture. And um, I think, you know, if we wanted to, and not that we're going to do that today, but, you know, it, it, it's easy to have a workshop on what happened and what led up to it and what we did. And, you know, there's a couple, you know, um, question and answers in a minute. But one of the things I think is most fascinating is how something as wanting to have better babies, you know, it's almost like a takeover from agriculture, because on this superficial level, it's not really a bad thing to make sure that there are that the kids will live, especially in an era of real life, you know, infant mortality to do everything we can to really give people like the best opportunity to get a good start in life. So the question is, how does that go rogue? And, and I was trying to find your slide about who early on was involved in it. You had people like John Harvey Kellogg, Sir William Osler. Um, uh, what was the woman who was the big um, birth control Margaret advocate? Sanger. Margaret Sanger. You know, I mean, you know, this was, this was, in the public domain and on the surface, it's not a bad idea. So the question is how those things get morphed into things that just are unrecognizable. So I'm, I'm not, I don't know the answer to that, but I think it's looking at the context and the fact that things are always more complicated than we, we, you know, we think. So, um, yeah. Jay, did you want to? Say something? Oh, I'll just say that. Um, so, A, you're right. Things are always more complicated um, than they seem. The roles of, you know, one of the reasons this history is not explored as much as it maybe should be and is not taught as often as it should be is because of the embarrassment, honestly, that the American medical community has 
in the roles that we played leading up to uh, the Nazi era, which always raises this question of, so why did this happen in Germany? Why did we not see similar um, events in the US? And I think, you know, on the one hand, um, it's really helpful to know that, you know, you can be on your way off the rails and yet not go completely all the way there. Um, there are choices, right? We have choices to make along the way. Not every country ended up looking like Nazi Germany. Um, so we made different choices. And how did that happen? How did we end up making, you know, different choices? I will also, by the way, just uh, acknowledge um, we made plenty of terrible choices. Hitler also was very inspired by our treatment of the native peoples of the US. Um, the fact that we, you know, successfully um, went from millions of indigenous people to only a couple hundred thousand indigenous people over the course of a few generations um, and were not blamed for that, that we did not get moral opprobrium for that, that we, you know, that we, we cast that as, you know, they were savages. Uh, we actually killed most of them through unintentionally infecting them with things that they died from. Um, but we also explicitly slaughtered people um, and did not get called to account for that. So that was inspirational to Hitler. Um, so I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, sugarcoat American history here, right? We have we have plenty of our own uh, genocide uh, in the past to, to look at. Um, and uh, we did not trace the eugenics path all the way to that. So why not? And, and I think one of the answers has to be that we continue to be a relatively free society. So eugenics continued to be a debated scientific theory in the US. There were people who thought it was bunk, right? Who thought it was hokum, that it was pop science, that it didn't have a, a real scientific foundation. And those people eventually won the day because you know additional research came along that showed they were largely correct, that it was mostly pop science that didn't have a solid foundation. In Germany, they shut that debate down. Having a single medical association, having everyone in tune, what they called synchronized, or there's a German word for that that I, I don't remember, but anyways, they, they were very much around this idea of everyone pulling in the same direction. We have never had everyone pulling in the same direction, and that is sometimes extremely frustrating during a pandemic, for example, um, but it's also a protective mechanism. And so I sort of use that as a as a consolation prize uh, when I think about how you know vitriolic our um, debates can be sometimes in the U.S. That it is better to be having vitriolic debates than it is to have everyone um, in, in line. Yeah. I agree. Um, I'm going to read some um, while I'm waiting for questions. Let me read something from the chat here. Um, and uh, somebody said, we saw this happen very recently with COVID in many states like Alabama, Kansas and others implemented medical resource rationing. This echoes a crisis similar to the German wartime crisis, the necessity of making quick decisions with limited supplies. These states put into policy that people with disabilities should be considered lower for lower priority for life-saving care. Disability orgs had to push back to make sure medical providers weren't using ableist perceptions of quality of life to deem um, people with disabilities less worthy of saving. Um, yeah. Also yeah, I will say, we, we actually did a, a program on this uh, in March of 2020, um, right as the pandemic was getting uh, underway, if you will, in the in the U.S. about the uh, about the legacy of Nazis and the treatment of disabled people and the ways in which that ought to inform the development of policies around triage because it was likely that we were going to have to do triage in one way or another, and that we wanted this to be on the table um, as you know as a warning sign 
that wars, pandemics, these are moments when you need to hew closely to your ethics um, and not ignore them uh, because it, it's where your ethics are most challenged um, that you really need to uh, maintain the footing. Yeah, I'm gonna let a seal um, ask a question. Yeah, thanks, Matt, for this great lecture. Um, so I like the question that you posed about um, how can we trust science and, and strike a balance between allowing science to advance um, um, while restoring the public's confidence. And so as a result of uh, the past experiments, um, scientists in Germany could be held um, criminally liable for um, collaborating with researchers uh, doing stem cell, um, uh, developing stem cell therapies outside of Germany. So how ought the law change to allow these researchers to continue, um, you know, provide better chances for uh, debilitating disease as well as assuring the public that it's not necessarily going to um, go down the same path as it did in the past? Yeah, I think, Celia, you're bringing up the um, the whole notion of uh, what some call the new eugenics, uh, trying to separate. Uh, and and I, I, sh I shouldn't criticize too much because I don't think it's just trying. I think there are separable factors between uh, the ways in which people use genetic knowledge today to try and improve the lives of everyone who is born. Um, not just those who are deemed to be valuable in society, right? And that's an extremely important distinction. Um, and at the same time, there are concerns um, with the so-called new eugenics, the idea being that, um, you know, there are, uh, there are European countries where essentially Down syndrome no longer exists because everyone uh, who has a, down syndrome child uh, has a prior genetic test or uh, you know, even just an ultrasound and ends up aborting that fetus. So prenatal genetic testing with, uh, in combination with ready access to abortion has population consequences. And they're not population consequences determined by the state Right, so the state didn't say you're not allowed to have a baby with Down syndrome. Um, they are population consequences that are derived from in the aggregate of individual choices. Those individual choices, of course, are influenced by social conditions and by social norms. And so you can you can get the same kind of outcome, but without the morally problematic. Um, things from Nazi, from the Nazi past. And the question is, is the outcome itself problematic? Is that a bad thing? Um, if you have a community in which everyone has come to an implicit understanding that if you do genetic testing on your fetus and you find that you have a Down syndrome child, you abort that child. Is that wrong? Um, it's not wrong in the sense that the state is telling you what to do. It's not wrong in the sense that anyone else is telling you what to do. It's all about individual choice, but it leads to this eugenic consequence. And that, I don't have an answer to that, by the way. I pose that as a question. I think this is not a, uh, an, a question that is liable to have a definitive, um, what someone calls substantive answer. It is a question that is likely more to have a procedural answer, meaning there are ways to mitigate some of these risks through establishing processes for decision making, but without saying what those decisions are going to be every time. But that's, you know, just my rough take on it. Anybody else have any questions? I just want to. Yeah. And <clears throat> Oh, uh, Dr. Heckmark, go ahead. Yes, uh, I <clears throat> can you clarify the situations of there are people like Darwin and Nietzsche and all. I 
tried a bit of a study to find out where they really, these people intentionally, where they were, or they are people, they pulled them, or these people wrote something, and the people refer to them in order to prove their own ideas. Yeah, and the answer is almost certainly both. Um, that to some extent they were, uh, they were capitalized upon. They had written something and it was cherry picked, right? So someone took the one quote that was the most supportive and pulled that forward and used it, as we tend to do, by the way, all of us tend to do this, find the one piece of thinking that, you know, supports our view and bring it forward and, and repeat it because we like it, because it resonates with us. So I think there are uh, ways in which, you know, uh, people who have sort of become infamous as a result of their Nazi association, maybe don't deserve it uh, because the Nazis use them in ways that they didn't intend to be used. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, these are really smart people. Maybe they should have seen where they were pointing the world. Right. And so if you've got uh, someone like uh, Carl Pearson or you've got someone, you know, like Nietzsche, um, it's hard to um, fault those who fault them for failing to see where this was going to lead. Thank you. OK, Paulo Camacho, you wanted to say something? Yes. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much uh, for that wonderful presentation. It was so wonderful and I, I learned so much. So thank you. Um, something, a thought that just sort of occurred to me as you were talking about science and, um, and you know, is, is, has been touched on, you know, the relationship between science and our ethics and the fact that, you know, the Nazis themselves had an ethical framework from which they were uh, sort of drawing from. I think it occurs to me that, I mean, this certainly isn't to say that science is value free because it's not, um, I don't think, but, you know, there does seem at least to me to be this sort of chasm between the insight that, you know, genetics hold some, or genes, or whether it's a Mendelian gene or, you know, Crick's gene, um, that that has some relationship to an organism's phenotype. Um, the leap from that sort of insight and its relationship to, you know, the survival of the fittest and then this sort of eugenicist program. You know, it seems to me that like, there is a normative chasm there that needs to be bridged. Um, this sort of normative, I guess, idea that needs to be imported to get from, you know, the theory of natural selection, Mendelian genetics, Crick's genetics, molecular biology, to the, oh, you know, we can genetically manipulate a person's genes such that we can turn them into a stronger or make them a member of a stronger race or group. Um, and I guess that's sort of a thought that occurred to me and I just wanted to, to see what your thoughts were regarding that. Um, again, I, I don't mean to say that science is value free or that the individuals you know, supporting these theses are value free, but yeah, I just wanted to get your thoughts. Yeah, I, it's such an important area. And unfortunately, like like many of the important uh, sort of lessons, I almost hesitate to use that term coming out of this. Um, it, is, it is hard to draw a single lesson from this because there is a sense in which, you know, what the Nazis thought they were trying to accomplish um, was based on science that was just bad. It was, you know, overly simplistic understandings of what comprises a genetic condition and, um, and overly simplistic understandings of ideas of race, right? Like, uh, which is barely genetic, if at all, in its, you know, in, in, in reality. Um, and so does that mean that we now, now that we have a much richer, more comprehensive, complex, albeit still very incomplete, understanding of human genetics and you know single gene mutations versus multi gene mutations and the roles of you know epigenetics, does that mean that we should go back and try again um, to create 
better, stronger, healthier people, which after all is the whole purpose of medicine is to give people a better chance at a healthier, you know, happier, longer life. Um, should we use those tools? And is the fact that the Nazis use those tools, does that in inherently put them off limits? Um, because the whole idea is wrong. And I, you know, the, the, where we are going right now is to say, no, it doesn't put them off limits. In fact, um, we need to be extremely cautious as we move into this new arena of genetic engineering and genetic enhancement. Um, but we're not gonna stop doing that. That's the consensus right now, that we are going to use these tools to try to create better, stronger, healthier people. And in the process, we are going to pay more attention to issues of equity and to issues of humility in understanding what we are actually capable of doing with these tools. And I, you know, the more I dig into this history, the scarier that all sounds to me. And yet I don't think we're gonna stop. Well, maybe that is the perfect place to leave it. I know you're gonna come back and talk to the ethics fellows at 1.30, so at least you can go and get a little- Actually, I, I have to go to a different meeting. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. So I, this is I really the end wanted of, to this talk to the, the ethics fellows. I'm happy to join you another day. <laughs> Listen, we will continue to talk about this, but this was terrific, Matt. And one of the things I will do is I will email you after get some resources for the group for further discussion, because I think this was um, excellent and timely and, um, if anything, this uh, your research and your interest has shown, especially in the last couple of years, you know, our naivete about these things cannot happen again. Our lived experience has shown that things are happening in our lifetime that many people did not anticipate would happen, happen again. You know, the things in the Capitol, you know, the pandemic. There are many things we have personally lived through in the last several years that five yeah. years ago would have We been had hoped we were past. Yeah, absolutely. So on behalf of your friends at the McLean Center and the other people who have now heard you and have learned from you, I want to thank you so much for coming and um, really give you kudos for a very stimulating talk. Mark, you can have the last word. Matt, that, that was fabulous. Um, uh, I, I'm, the, the entire talk was, was very moving. Uh, I had one question that I was saving uh, for, for the next, our next meeting, which was of the estimated 6 million uh, Jews who were killed uh, uh, during World War II uh, as, as part of the me medical process, what percent of those might have been killed in Germany as opposed to elsewhere in Europe? Oh, uh, it's a very small number uh, were German Jews. Uh, I did not mention, by the way, the programs I talked about, um, the T4 program and so on, killed very few Jewish people. Interesting. Um, those were programs aimed at, you know, the German, at strengthening the German community. They were not aimed at eliminating Jewish people. Um, Jewish people in Germany largely escaped, not, not entirely, obviously. So just, you know, but on the numbers, um, the German community of Jewish people was relatively small compared to Poland, for example, or the uh, or you know Eastern Europe. Yes. Um, so it was a smaller community to begin with, and they had more time to decide whether they wanted to leave or not. And so a fair number of people got out of Germany before um, it was not no longer possible. And the killing centers, the big killing centers were, as you know, largely outside of Germany. So Auschwitz is in, you know, outside of Krakow, Poland, um, Treblinka in, so all of these are outside of Germany. And so the, the, of the 6 million, the vast majority were not Germans. Thank you. Fascinating. I, I had not known that. Yeah. But, but my, my deepest thanks for your talk and Thanks. I want to thank the group for, for being present and participating. 
Um, and we look forward to having you visit us occasionally in Chicago. <laughs> Me too. Wonderful. Thank you all. Thank you.